Okay. okay. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. We are uh, happy to see a, a very large uh, number of uh, attendees this morning here at the uh, HEADS webinar series. We hope that you are healthy and safe, the same for your families during this uh, confinement period or a uh, toque de queda en español. So um, that's, that's uh, you know, good for everybody. I want to introduce myself. My name is Carlos Morales. I am a president of TCC Connect Campus in Fort Worth, Texas, an online campus, part of Tarrant County College District, and a vice chair for the HEADS organization. So happy to be here facilitating this webinar this morning. I also have a Ms. Jubelkis Montalvo, who is executive director of HEADS, and she has an announcement for us before we continue with the session. So, you bell kids. Yes, thank you, Carlos, uh, our vice chair of the board of directors of HEADS. Uh, by the way, Carlos, uh, I would like to mention that you are Puerto Rican, but you have been uh, living in the States for a long time, and now you, well, you have been in Taran like more than almost 10 years now, right? Yes. So, yeah. so we are happy to have all your expertise and also helping us putting together these webinars. I only want to mention that please keep uh, looking at the HEADS website. We already uh, upload a new, uh, new news uh, announcing the Student Leadership Showcase uh, tour that we will have totally online. That will be for students. The day is uh, a Friday, uh, May the 1st, and will be at 11 a.m. Uh, our time, Puerto Rico time. And please help us uh, spreading the word of this event for your students. Also, remember that we have a lot of tutorials in English and Spanish for students to go and see how they can benefit from the Student Placita uh, services that are totally free of charge, and you can have the news right here. And please keep looking to next events. Today we are doing the the one with Taran from many to one online online courses review tools and standards. But we have a new a new one in Spanish uh, on Thursday by Dr. Ana Milena Lujumi. This will be at 3 p.m. Uh, our time, Puerto Rico time. And on Friday we have another webinar with Dr. Rosa Ojeda in Spanish for us and then we have uh, um, the student leadership showcase we are trying to put together two more webinars with uh, for next week with one uh, tito melendez and also with dr jose ferrer both from upr and as soon as we set up the dates and time we will let you know okay so thank you so much and please uh, see that when you go to our services here in english webinars you can click there and you can reach the you can See there the links to the recordings of the webinars and the same in the Spanish webinars. Okay, thank you so much and have a. I hope that you enjoyed this webinar a lot. Let me start stop sharing my screen so our presenters can uh, share their presentation. Thank you, Carlos. And um, and at the end, as I mentioned before, you will be re, uh, we will be activating the chat so you can post your questions. And also remember that as soon as we finish the webinar, send us an email to info at heads.org uh, to send you the certificate of participation if you are interested in receiving it. Okay, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Go ahead. Thank you, Jubelkis, for for the announcement. Um, so right, right to the uh, interest of our time this morning, uh, the webinar title is From Many to One, Aligning Online Course Review Tools and Standards. And the presenters are Austin Haynes, e-learning graphic designer, and David Denny, instructional designer from TCC Connect Campus at Tarrant County College. Um, just a, a, a small set of housekeeping rules here. We have a very large uh, audience this afternoon, so we are very pleased with that. And uh, we hope to allow for 15 minutes uh, at the end for any questions that uh, may come from the audience. So Austin and David, uh, please take it away. Uh, hi, my name is Austin Haynes. Uh, I'm gonna start and I'm gonna just say thank you, Dr. Morales, and thank you all for your time. 
we appreciate that today. Um, David and I work on the instructional design team here at Tarrant County College, and uh, one of our goals is to uh, assist faculty more effectively in peer developed course process. So working alongside and shoulder to shoulder with the faculty, there are a lot of things to consider. So I'm going to uh, start sharing our presentation now and just walk y'all through kind of this process. I'm gonna introduce the first uh, portion of this and then David's gonna take it at the end to talk to you directly about the tools that he and I have been able to generate. Uh, David has done a lot of work generating these tools. I'm just gonna collaborate and support and, and uh, help David. So um, whenever we start to look at standards in course design, we have uh, external rubrics that we uh, need to align our courses to. And in our case, the first thing we want to consider is SACS or COC. They are the governing body that accreditates our college. And so we want to make sure we meet the needs of those in our courses because if we are reviewed, and, and this is a year where we were going to be until the COVID-19 uh, crisis hit, and so we want to align with their structure. We want to align with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And then we are part of the Quality Matters group. So we also want to align. That is a choice of ours. But those, by aligning with the Quality Matters uh, organization, we do accomplish the goal of SACS and, and the Texas Higher Education Board. However, there is different wording in each of those rubrics. Although there is um, a, a alignment of ideas in there, they are not aligned because they are three different rubrics by which we are reviewing our courses. And then internally, the Tarrant County College Master Syllabus, the district core curriculum, we on our campus, because we're the online campus for our college, have the online instructor's handbook. We have created a faculty performance indicator uh, review process, which uh, Dr. Morales had spearheaded with what we call e-faculty coaches which they are act actively going into the courses to uh, look at the uh, content and the way that instructors are actually working in their courses. And then we have the guidelines of the online instructor certification process, which is the process we do to uh, allow instructors to be online, full online teachers for our, our college and campus. And then we also have to think about uh, ADA compliance, which is 508 standards compliance. The necessity of all of these rubrics uh, creates a model where if we are working with faculty, we can spend an inordinate, a great deal of time uh, just in the review process. And so uh, David, who works directly with faculty, um, and, uh, immediately started to express concerns about this when we were talking about this because we're looking at all these different rubrics. And so we, uh, David came up with the idea of seeking to align these things. So what is present in the district master syllabus is also present in the district core curriculum and also present in the education board standards, for instance. So there's no sense to make faculty uh, look at all three of those things when we can seek alignment in those structures and that alignment can be expressed in a digital document. And David's going to talk about that here in the future. But that's the overview of what we're talking about here. So these are the internal and external rubrics that we're looking at. And so uh, if you look here, we have uh, seven on this side and three here. So right there, we have 10 rubrics that we could be looking through. And that's quite considerable, especially if you consider um, that we have a chance of making missing some things in there and we have a chance of breakdown in communication and collaboration among ourselves as the instructional designers and faculty working together, let alone when we get to the end and we are aligning all these standards uh, to review courses once they're complete. Um, if we align these standards, what it'll allow us is more time to work directly with faculty as instructional design staff to help them develop content and assets inside of their online courses. So looking at our model in our, in our district or, or at our campus, what we start with generally is we start with the administrator talking to the department chair and key faculty members about creating a course. So they may come together and say, we want to create a biology 1301 course. And once they've had that discussion and decide that that is something we want to create, a course that we are going to build out with all the content in conjunction with faculty, then the key <clears throat> faculty members, the department chairs and the deans will reach out to 
uh, the administration and reach out to the faculty members, the subject matter experts, and start talking to them about how we're going to build the course out, that they are all going to be on a team, they are going to work with each other, and they are going to help each other and support each other and, and build this collaboratively. Once they start that process, they reach out to the project manager, our lead. Most of the time it is the instructional designer. And so right there, you have the opportunity for uh, five people to be working together and three in the case of the subject matter experts. So really you're talking about seven or eight people because we generally assign three subject matter experts to the course development. There's a lot of opportunity there for people to uh, lose each other in communication. And uh, these rubrics that we're looking at, if we're looking at 10 different rubrics, that can create a great deal of redundancy and repetition in the review process as we move through. Our goal in creating what David is going to show you here in just a second was at the very beginning, we established these standards for review so that we're constantly working for those uh, high standards of review once we uh, start the course. Not getting to the end of the course and then all of a sudden introducing a review model that the faculty are no, not aware of at that point and really putting them back at step one. So as you can see, this model uh, starts to get more involved as we involve more members of the instructional design team and technology support. And that can lead to mass uh, confusion because once again, we are looking at, on our, fac on our team, we are looking at seven or eight members looking at this process through the eyes of 10 rubrics. And so we wanted to make sure that we created a model that caused less confusion for faculty and allowed us to have very effective, very streamlined and very unified discussions in relation to these standards that we're looking at in, in our course creation. And so I'm gonna step forward here and talk about the fact that establishing an effective aligned communication model is vital. It will allow less repetition in course review and build better understanding among faculty and instructional design staff. Most problems uh, in any organization is the communication model. And once a clear a line of communication and collaboration is established, all we have to do is maintain that model. So what we are going for is this here, which is a communication model for an instructional designer-centered peer-developed course process. So as you can see here in this center circle, um, let me make sure I've got my point. In this center circle, we have the instructional designer as the project manager. And so because they are the one who is, who, who is unifying this message, majority of the information is coming into them. And that, that's why we have the administration and the faculty separate over here with a direct line of communication for each, other, for each other whenever they start to talk about the creation of the course. And we put the instructional designer at the center of that so that there is somebody who is a point of con, con, consistent information for the faculties and, and subject matter experts once the process started. It does not take out the administration and the dean. It just allows this focus portion of this model. And you how that can go awry is here. If we have a faculty-centered model, which the faculty and the SME is in the center of the model here, we have a deal more opportunity for miscommunication between the key player of the faculty and the instructional designer and ADA compliance officer here, or excuse me, instructional designer project manager here. If the faculty member is having to have communication about all of the standards inside the rubric with all of these other stakeholders, then it can cause quite a few opportunities for miscommunication. And so this slide kind of shows, breaks down that communication model here. In the instructional designer center focused process, we have an opportunity only twice for there to be miscommunication. Faculty and SME could have a miscommunication with the designer. The faculty and SME could have an a miscommunication with the instructional designer who's a multimedia artist uh, in support of them if they, if they offer, have the opportunity to work because once again, this is the instructional design team. On the faculty SME focus side, we have an opportunity for five missed up communication opportunities. So we wanted to build a model that allowed us to bypass that at the beginning. And that's what David's going to talk about here next. 
because his role and my role uh, as instructional designers is we have a managerial aspect, which is where the project manager, we have a social aspect, which is the group facilitator, and we have a curricular aspect, which is the instructional design expert. We're there to support them in uh, how to best present their material in a digital environment. Uh, we are not there to ever correct us me about their content. That is something that would happen among the subject matter experts in re the review process of the curriculum. We are just there in support of developing the course. And so with that, I want to turn it over to David Denny, who is going to lead you through the remainder of the process. David, are you there? Thank you, Austin. How do I sound? You sound good, brother. Okay. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody, um, and thank you for attending. I'm really um, impressed that there's 116 people in this uh, webinar. I did not expect it to be that large. Um, my name is David Denny, and I'll be walking you through our peer-developed process that we are currently building. It is not complete yet. We are probably two-thirds of the way there, though. And as you see, I put up this graphic, um, and our system breaks down very similar to this. Uh, it starts with identifying a course need. Academic affairs leadership starts with identifying the course needs, uh, looking at a variety of factors such as course demand, availability of subject matter experts, et cetera, to decide on which courses are going to be redesigned next as a PDC course, a uh, peer developed course. I'll often refer to it as PDC. Um, then the course will go through an initial approval process involving the department chair, the assistant deans, and finally the, the dean. And that takes us to the third, let me grab my pointer, the third part uh, of our process, which is the PDC process. And that's what I'll be talking mostly about today. Um, and some people might think it's the boring side of instructional design because it's project, it's so project related, uh, project management related. Uh, but I have found that a lot of instructional designers inherently have that skill as well and enjoy that process. So that's what uh, we're going to look at today. So after approval, administrate uh, initial approval, then we set up the PDC process. Um, after that is set up course development starts, which is the 10 week process of where the course is actually being built. Um, the instructional designers are highly involved with the SMEs throughout the process with weekly evaluations at the least. Um, after that, it goes through an approval process, which is where we run it through the rubrics, which I'll show you in just a second. And then after we run it through the rubric, Everything passes, um, it gets approved, it moves into continuous improvement stage, which it will be in throughout the life of the course. And as Austin had pointed out earlier, you will see here that there is um, a definite connection between all of the rubrics that we have to align to, starting with the Department of Education, SACS, uh, the Texas Higher Ed Education Coordinating Board, then the Tarrant County College District, and then our own campus where the peer develop courses begin. Now, the tool that I use for the project management side of this is called Smartsheet, and I realize that a lot of you won't have that software. And another alternative to using something like this would be um, the G Suite, the Google Suite of uh, sheets that they offer. So now I'd like to dive into the process. All of these components, there's seven components to the process. Each seven items you see on this slide represent one piece of the process. I will show an example of each one of these items as we proceed. But for now, notice that there are no arrows that define a systematic process, much like um, Austin was describing earlier. And that is because these components all feed off each other in some way, but not necessarily in a linear fashion. And I'll explain more about that as we go. Um, 
for example, you look at PDC forms. This is used to populate active courses, and it's basically just a form that we fill out that, that populates a spreadsheet-like item. Now, the, these active courses list is also used by leadership to determine which courses are in which stage of the process in one single view. At the same time, the PDC dashboard over here is generated from the reports above it and active courses and the QM rubric. So everything is tied together, but not in a normal linear fashion. And this is where your project management skills definitely come in. So we start with a form. This is what we use to input the course project information when we start a project. And it's and every one of these fields that you see on this form will become a column in a spreadsheet. And it populates it automatically. Google Sheets will do that with a Google Forms just as nicely. This is the sheet that that form populates. And each one of these columns is a field in that form. And as you can see, these are all active peer developed courses that are um, in progress in one stage or another. It functions exactly like an Excel spreadsheet. Now notice that the column headers match the form fields from the previous slide. Each line is a PDC course in some stage. Colors represent the stage in the process. Um, and you can attach files to this sheet to show that. So like if I was gonna show you the, le the color legend, I've attached this file that tells you exactly what the colors mean on the courses, where they are in the process. This component is another spreadsheet, but this one is the project timeline. Now this is the first sheet that is actually shared with the SMEs. This basically becomes their weekly task list. Notice how this one, a history timeline, um, is specific toward lessons in history. And this basically will break down what each SME, there's three SMEs in this case. Um, beca and because Smartsheet is, is connected to our Outlook exchange here at TCC, we can actually set this sheet to auto email due dates, tasks that are past due, et cetera. It really is nice for automation. Um, now here's the, here's the rubric that we've been talking about. Right now, this is only the quality matters rubric in, it, in its exact form. All I did was just transfer it over to a smart sheet um, which is a spreadsheet and basically automated it so that um, it just makes it a lot quicker to grade. So uh, the primary component we use to evaluate every course, this is it. We built the entire long version of the QM rubric, annotations and all, and if any, any of you are familiar with the QM rubric, um, the long version is very long. Um, each course gets a fresh copy of this rubric. So we just copy this and make one for every course that we do. On uh, Each standard is simply checked or not checked, which either assigns a one, two, or three points, just like the QM rubric works. Um, and that is depending on its importance as defined by QM. Notice the green box in the upper right-hand corner right here. I don't know how well you can read that. Let me, let me zoom in on that. Um, this also comes, this is also is populated from the first form that I showed you. And that just assigns and gives check, approval check boxes to the project lead, which is the, the lead SME, the developers, all the SMEs, the instructional designers, and then finally the dean gets the final approval before it becomes a peer developed course. Now, another thing, I was talking about the annotations. If you'll look over on the far left in that uh, column that is circled by red, those 
uh, icons are basically bubble conversation bubbles. And this is where we bring all of QM's annotations right into this sheet. So for instance, if you're looking at standard 1.1, instructions make clear how to get started and where to find various course components. If a, a SME is not quite sure um, how to meet that standard, then uh, he just clicks on this little icon right there and it pulls up the conversations, which is the part on the right hand side and we can add to those conversations as we go. Um, here's a blown up version of an annotation. Um, okay. Notice the check marks, the check boxes in the under, um, oops, excuse me, I'm sorry, I got lost. Okay. Notice the, um, we had to include all of the annotations that come with it without making the sheet too large and cumbersome. So we did this using that conversations tool. Okay, this is the bottom half of the rubric. Um, this will tally a score for um, each course as we check boxes or don't check boxes, leaving notes in the comments and recommendations for change section. Um, a, a course has to reach an 80 or a, at least an 80 in order to pass the initial evaluation from the e-learning department before we would even move it up to the deans. Now this is my favorite part of the smart sheet and that is the ability to build dashboards. Um, the dashboard is built from all of this data and information that we have plugged in to the other components in the system. Um, this offers a high level view of the, of the peer developed course process. This is something that Dr. Morales would want to see right away. How many completions have we had this semester? How many did we have last semester? How many have we had for the year? What's the status of all of the uh, uh, courses that are in progress right now? And all of this information comes from just doing that little bit of work ahead of time and plugging all that information into uh, sheets that are tied to each other. Um, and then you can have something like that. Now, these things are mainly generated from reports, which is another sheet. Um, and you can just program these and they're very easy programs to use. I'm not a programmer by any means. If you can do Excel formulas, you can do this. Uh, it's the same thing and you can get reports. Like I got a list of all of the courses that are in the queue that need start dates that haven't, they've been approved, but they haven't been started yet. That list is probably too long for Dr. Morales right now. Um, you can see the ones that were recently approved the ones that were paw that are in pause right now, the ones that are past due and in progress. So you can run a lot of reports, get a lot of information, and really keep track of your courses. I think I went really fast, um, and I have finished that early. And I know there might be a lot of questions. I'm not used to doing it in this format, so I apologize for that. Um, but I will. Um, at this time, open it up for questions. And Austin may have some comments if he's still there. I think I see him. I am here. I'm still here. Okay. Um, so, and and I'm going to step oh. back to here, Dave. Sorry, uh, and just comment on this and let them know. At this point, uh, that's the bottom half of it, right? The top half was. There, I'm sorry. There's where I want to go. So looking at this slide, I just wanted to uh, talk about this is where we're talking about alignment here. Over on the uh, left-hand side of the screen here, you see the course overview and introduction. These are the standards 1.1, 1.2 that are established by the QM, if you're familiar with those. Over here, there is the drop-down screen that Dave has included that has the entirety of that standard and all the necessary uh, requirements of that standard. 
this is where we are starting to pull in stuff. So what we, we have done is we'll take something like the Texas Higher Education Board's standards and we'll use just that one for me and Dave to sit down, look over in this box and start going, okay, that's similar to that. So our intents, we haven't done this yet, is to include the same standard that matches here under THECB, for instance, here so that whenever we are reviewing, we'll go, okay, we've met standard 1.1 of the QM. Simultaneously, we've met standard fill in the blank of the THECB. And as we align all of these standards, Dave will also add inside of this tool that we have aligned with the THECB by aligning with this standard of the QM. And then once we get successfully that integrated into this model, then we'll go to the next one, which would be SACS, or uh, of our internal review processes. So that was what we were talking about with alignment there. And that is the physical representation of that that Dave is creating inside of this form. Sorry, I just wanted to get up on that. Excellent. Uh, we already activate the chat, so you can either uh, you can post your questions there, so our presenters can see them. Can you see the chat, uh, guys? Austin and David. Yes, yeah. Okay, perfect. You can put the, your questions there, so they can definitely go ahead and and answer any question. I have a question. A uh, what a platform? I'm not sure if you see it, say it at the beginning. Sorry because I was uh, replying some some questions, uh, some emails uh, of participants. Uh, what platform is the one that you use? I know that for the courses are Blackboard, right? But this one is, is, is specifically. Can you have give more details about that? Oh, no. Um, the system that we put all of these processes in is called Smartsheet. It's a project management tool and it's becoming very popular. I know a lot of universities are adopting it, um, but Google Suite, the G Suite, will work just as well for this. And uh, I see Alma Vega has asked, uh, are you using Blackboard Learn or Blackboard Ultra version? We're using Blackboard Learn at this point, Alma. And then Marcos Torres asked, uh, how big is your distance education program? Right now it's everybody. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and generally, Austin, yes, I'm sorry for a second. If on, on that question, I was following that. If you want to um, summarize what we do and, and uh, the number of courses and students we serve, et cetera, et cetera, that would be yes, good for that type of question. Yes, sir. Generally, if, and Dr. Morales, please step in here. I believe our general population during a, a fall and spring semester is between 12 and 14,000 students. In the summer, and I'm not sure of the total numbers, we are we represent last summer, for instance, total for our college, 45% of student enrollment was, I believe, the number from last summer, uh, which during the summer, I believe the enrollment was between 28 and 30,000 students. So we represent almost half of that also. Um, and so, sorry, I'm just rereading this course. And the courses offered, uh, I, I did know that number. I am I sorry, can, I don't know that number I can, right now. I can interject. The, the, num the figures that Austin uh, is, is mentioning uh, are headcount. So when you uh, translate that to enrollments, uh, it changes a little bit. So 11,000, 12,000 uh, headcount translates to 20 or 22,000 uh, students taking online courses. Uh, as he said, in the summer, we are 40% of the enrollments for the for the college that is about um, maybe nine or ten thousand students as well uh, there the um, uh, the other thing we have 31 fully online programs uh, and that is give or take 250 uh, courses uh, so we are a fully online campus for the college and we have all the responsibilities in terms of scheduling hiring uh, um, uh, training faculty supporting them etc cetera, etc cetera. so so that is a pretty is a pretty large uh, uh, operation there so i just wanted to interject that detail austin yes, thanks sir dave will you can you pull up something allegra just asked did we show what a finished course looks like can you show that and then alma vega you asked uh, um or, excuse me nancy velasquez you asked how can this 10-week process be simplified during the urgency to develop online courses due to our current crisis. 
we actually just had that uh, about two weeks ago now, uh, really before. But one of the things that happened was the science department, because we the chancellor made an announcement that we were going to go fully online till the end of the summer. The science departments for all of our traditional face-to-face -face campuses reached out to Dr. Morales and asked him in conjunction with the face-to-face -face faculty to develop these online assets for their courses. So one of the first things we did we're talking about uh, content, and we've talked about that with Dr. Morales before. Uh, in Dr. Morales' past, as he was a science educator, so if somebody's already developed an asset for the mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell, there's no need to recreate that. So one of the things we did to start uh, increasing the speed with which these courses could be developed is we have quite a few faculty who are going to be teaching online this summer, and we looked at we have seven week courses during the summer. Uh, talking to faculty about um, them getting together, them working in con consort and collaboration with each other to to assign weeks to each other. So a couple of faculty members take the first week, a couple of faculty members take the second week. And uh, when you have faculty doing that process and working in uh, alignment with each other, they're not having to create their entire course. They're able to create a collaborative version of a course in less amount of time. Uh, they have to unify their instructional method. They have to look at keeping an uh, aligned um, textbook or uh, re uh, reference resource for their course. And that, while there is, you know, not much we can say about the current crisis, that will allow faculty to work together. And uh, that is positive, I should say. Uh, th that will allow faculty to work together and help them to uh, uh, better uh, understand that if they collaborate together, that's one of the best ways to beat the idea of online cheating and tests. Uh, a lot of times we're looking at proctoring and things like that, but all studies really point to the best way to beat online cheating and tests is for faculty to regenerate assets for their courses in, in their test banks on a pretty regular basis, because as we all know, they all those questions end up in Quizlet and things like that pretty quick. And so that uh, that is one of the positive things that the baby has come out of this, and that will help us expedite and move this forward a little faster. Uh, Alma asks, you use only smart sheets for this pro project management process? No, uh, David's been with us two years now, David, right? And before David was there, we were using Google Sheets, and David was using when he first got here. David brought this tool to everybody's attention about 12 or 14 months ago, I believe, and that started this process. And so we were moving it forward from there. But we, as David mentioned, we were using Google uh, um, forms and Google Sheets to uh, do this work. And Milton asked you decentralized. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to think ahead, say that Dr. Morales, maybe you would want to field the question from uh, Milton Ramirez. You see that one? Yes. Um, well, w one of the things uh, that is, uh, I guess, unique or different here is that the campus is uh, completely online. So everybody that is hired and participate with, with us uh, comes from the notion that uh, there are elements that maybe have been uh, solved for them. So for example, the peer developed courses are um, in any other location, they are called as master courses. So uh, faculty facilitate courses as well. They can design courses but uh, if, if you come usually you can you can use that uh, as your starting point um, moving forward the other thing is that the support and the design for training is completely done online the e faculty coaches that were mentioned and the and the uh, uh, quality uh, assurance measures that we have put together like the um, fpi are things that uh, faculty know from the get go so again everybody everybody uh, understands that we are paying attention to uh, the administration of the virtual classroom, the online presence, the, the metrics in terms of student success. Certainly, uh, we want faculty to be successful. So we have built in a, a, a multiplicity of activities that assist faculty in their endeavor. Um, and, and simply because the campus is completely online in, in other organizations, 
uh, that online is um, either a department or a, something that is in continuing education to assist the university with revenue. The, the lens is different because a faculty a, at times they are not necessarily at the table in terms of, of quality and in terms of content. A, they are more on the side of, a, how would you call this, a, 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 certainly subject matter experts, but but more on a, a, a secondary thought rather than on a primary thought, uh, as opposed to what we do here. And uh, I just, uh, I, saw, I saw a bunch of questions coming up, uh, how many academic programs you have and things like that. But I also see, are you taking into consideration students' needs for the new course design? And do you have a master template for each course? The QM is kind of part of our master template, but we also have standardize our navigation and things like that. But Allegra Anna Davis is one of our faculty members, and this is her. She's, she's going to show you some of her course here. And hers, her course represents pretty much what we look for in course design, but she's very student-centered. And the next question I just wanted to, before you say anything, Allegra, somebody asked, are you taking into consideration students' needs? Uh, Allegra can definitely address that, and she definitely takes in student needs, and it's a guiding light for us whenever we're start doing course design. So go ahead, Allegra, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Um, I was just going to walk you through uh, what a finished course looks like. So when we first get the empty shell, the navigation is built over here to the side, and that's what the team has decided is standard navigation for our courses. Um, and <clears throat> we have like information filled in that tells you to put certain things here. So I'll show you, for instance, if it's going to pull up. Well, I deleted it. So, but there, under Meet Me Your Instructor, there's usually something here that says, um, that's hidden from students that says, in this space, include at least a picture and a brief bio, but you can also include um, additional photos or if you have one, an introduction video. And so we have little markers in each area that are hidden from students so that as uh, somebody gets the course, they know how to use it. They're also in here for people to help build the courses. And then we have a section that is for instructors only, and you can see it's hidden from students. And it just lists all the prompts for the discussion boards and journals. That way we can build the grade book objects ourselves when we get the course. Um, and we don't get a grade book full of stuff. So a typical lesson looks like this. Um, I don't remember which one. It's a great looking one. So I'm just going to roll the dice here. So this is pre-populated with um, the layout. So it shows overview, learning outcomes, checklist. And then as the course is built, the faculty fill that in. But the instructional designers tell us a standard layout for the overview section. So every course, this should be the same in every lesson. Um, and then we just have notes. I added these little images for my students, so those aren't part of the standard course. But um, there's a PDF of notes for the lesson. I'm not going to teach you about setting, I promise. Uh, and the assessments that the faculty have built. And you're going to notice that every lesson looks pretty similar. Um, and that's obviously by design. So our goal, and what Dr. Morales' initial goal was, is for when students open an online course, they know where to go, and they know what things will look like, and they have not an identical experience in every course, but something that is predictable. The same way when you walk into a classroom, you know the chairs are facing the front and your teacher's going to stand behind the lectern. When you go into an online class, you start here, there's where you find announcements, here's where you find the lesson materials. And of course, it's obviously we can personalize it because I've added all of these little images and, and files. So again, the checklist, this one has a video that's linked. Again, we have a PDF of the notes and the assessment. And so this, the lessons look pretty similar all the way through. 
and I just add little banner images um, to make it a little less plain looking. And this is what my students are working on now. So thank you, Milton. <laughs> so they're working on research and it just shows them lesson intro um, links on how to do research and then the discussion board assignment. And so every course should look the same way or be set up in a similar fashion. But um, again, they're open for personalization. And one that we just finished building is this humanities class. Again, I'm going to roll the dice and assume that it's going to look similar. So this is what it looks like when students open it. Again, we have the standard navigation links. And this, so this is not it. This, I'm not using this course. This is what the, it looks like when somebody adopts it for the very first time. And so the red text indicates this is where instructors should fill something in. And that's got the master syllabus. And so all the lessons are folders, and they're going to look pretty similar. So description, objectives, and checklist. And then in the lesson introduction, links to videos. That text needs to be reformatted. I'll fix it. And uh, assessments down here. So they're going to look pretty standard. And when you get a course as a faculty member, there are things like the syllabus and the instructor information that you have to customize so that it has your name and your contact information and then up to you and your personality how much additional stuff you want to personalize so if you want to go crazy like I did and put images in every folder you can and Allegro you have somebody with a question uh, Rosemary Morales I believe she raised her hand okay how do I know what her question is? Um, I'm not sure if she wants to speak or if she wants to type that question, Rosemary. Do you still, do you still have a question for us? Oh, she lowered her hand. I may have accidentally did that. Oh, okay, all right, no problem. But yeah, if anybody has, oh, we don't have any synchronous interactions in our online courses. Um, part of that is because we have four-week classes, eight-week classes, and 16-week classes. And so in the part of it, the initial design is to build a course that's flexible so that it can be taught during any of those lengths. So the peer-developed course doesn't have synchronous, but if a person wants to um, have a collaborate session like this, they can easily just build one right into their course and so they can do a synchronous presentation for their students if they want to. Uh, that would be part of what the instructor brings to the course as, a, as opposed to what the course designers um, put into it. Any other questions for the presenters? I don't know if you answered the Alfonso Lozada question. Do you have written guidelines somewhere, web page blogs, etc., on how to design specific courses? Did you answer this one? Um, so there is a general guide that the instructional designers give us in that smart sheet so we see like what we need to build. Uh, and then when we get an empty shell, it has um, the general layout is set up for us and it tells us and there's a blank lesson folder that says you need to put objectives you need to, to do this and we also have access to look at completed courses so we have a guide for how it should be created and then the system is designed to give us checks so the instructional designer checks in with us and make sure that we're not designing something totally crazy and one of our initial rubrics is what we call online instructor certification, which kind of establishes those guidelines. And that's represented in a course that is uh, uh, um, a, that all the online faculty have to take. And they have to pass the course, and it requires them to learn to develop a lesson and to set up navigation like we've set it up. 
And a great example of that is when his crisis was first identified, we were pulled aside by the administration in our district because we had been working on an emergency academic continuity plan, and we were able to pull out of our online instructor certification course some key assets that we were then able to uh, simplify and utilize them to create a, a simple course that would help face-to-face -face faculty um, be able to go online with their course. And I think the training we set out takes less than two and a half hours if they run through the entire process of that to uh, to to get a kind of cursory, simplified overview of what our online instructors need to know to create courses. And also, and Mabiga also asked if uh, how many academic programs you have developed in online schedule type, mm -hmm. and how do you keep your courses updated? We update them every few years, so uh, I can just say because I'm also a department chair that I keep track of how old a course is, and if it's more than like two years old, I'm going to ask faculty who teach that course, if I don't teach it myself, to um, take a look at it and see if it can be either updated and kind of just add a few things um, or completely redesigned from the ground up. And so there are some courses that we're already on the second build of. So we're about to start a new build of um, technical writing, for instance, because there's just, we've advanced in our understanding of the process. So we do, our, our department chairs kind of keep track of where courses sit and whether they can be updated. And if I notice that I'm making a lot of changes to the um, courses that I use that I'm going to recommend to the instructional design team, hey, let's put this back on the schedule so we can redesign it because there's a lot of updates that we need to make. And also, uh, this example of that, Allegra jumping into here and talking about the allows you to talk to a faculty member. And Allegra is one of those weird faculty members that uh, solicits and, and actually reads the responses from her students. And so she'll come in and say, I tried this new tool. I'm getting this type of feedback from my students. Or I tried a way of simply designing a lesson, and I'm getting this feedback from my students. And as you can see, she teaches uh, English language arts things. Uh, that will help us because all of this comes to communication, and her communication with us helps us bring that to other courses too. And since she's a she can have shorthand conversations with faculty members saying, I tried this tool in my language arts course. You might want to try it in your writing assignment, in your history course, or something like that. And that happens quite frequently. Um, they, they give us feedback. They get the feedback from students. They give each other feedback. And then um, if we're listening and paying attention, the best thing we can do is uh, institute whatever it is that they're seeing success with with students directly into the course. Excellent. Also, I'm not sure if you uh, answered this question uh, of Erika. If we decide to use synchronic interactions, what is the recommended time? So I would ask my students when is a good time for them to have a synchronous interaction. Uh, I would also recommend recording it if you are using Collaborate or um, Canvas conferences, so whatever tool you're using in your LMS, uh, I would record it and make the recording available for students who couldn't attend it live. But, um, you know, I would just see what your students need. So if it's a class that started out being online and what has been online all semester, for instance, you might not have any synchronous content. You might just say, I have six hours and you can visit and we can schedule a call. But um, if it is a class that was face-to-face -face originally and has been emergency converted to online, those students might actually really want to see your face and um, have a live lesson. And so just, I mean, doing a brief survey with them and asking when the best time to schedule something is and then making it available after the fact for students to access it so that if they were working there, their kids were in the room, then they can watch it later. Also, I'm a little nervous because it looks like Austin just left the session. Excellent. I don't see any other question. Do you? I think all questions have been answered. I would, I would like to say 
thank you to all of you for this excellent presentation. I also want to make two announce, very short announcements. Please, uh, uh, the ones who are requesting certificates, please allow us a little bit of time because we have a lot of uh, a certificates requested that we are preparing and we are only two people working right now. So please, uh, thank you for your patience. If you don't receive it for a week, uh, in, in a period of a week, then uh, email us, uh, just in case we miss your your email. And, and the second thing is that we are recording this. You can uh, see all the recordings on the same page that you register. Uh, the ones uh, for the English and the ones for the Spanish are in two different pages. So go back and you will see all the recordings. And also the link for each webinar will be sent uh, at least two or three hours ahead uh, before, excuse me, the, 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 the webinar because we, at the, at the last moment, we still receiving uh, people who are registering and we don't want to miss every anyone. So please give us some uh, time to receive the, the link for the webinar and the link will be sent to the same email that you register with the email that you register. Okay. So Carlos, if you want to uh, add something at the end, if this is the time and thank you, yes. Allegra, David yes. and Austin, you have been awesome. Yes, and, and again, I want to thank the, the team, uh, Austin, David, and uh, Professor Davis for uh, their availability to share some of the things that they have um, uh, spearheaded and led for the faculty as well as for instructional designers at uh, TCC Connect Campus. Also, I want to thank uh, the audience uh, that they have been very, very patient. Uh, patient, I'm sorry, with um, the questions and how all this information has been delivered for you. So uh, if there are any other questions, certainly I think that we can uh, uh, receive those either through Ubelkis or through the uh, contact information you have found for the staff at the uh, announcement. Uh, and again, we remain available for any other questions. So I don't have anything else. Uh, Ubelkis and audience, thank you again for the opportunity and, and be well. Excellent. Yes, stay safe. And if you think you, we can coordinate another webinar in English before we finish the semester, it will be great. Let us know because, as you may see, people are really e eager to learn and, um, and, and, and learn from your best practices. So thank you so much for sharing. So yes, have be, a good day. Uh -huh. Yes, we'll be following up with, with other topics as, the, as they are identified. So thank you again. Excellent. Thank have you. a great day. You too. Bye, Take care. Bye. Bye, Austin. Bye, Allegra. Take care.